one anothering. Pointing out to you that the, the preponderance in terms of, of one topic, one subject, under the whole one another fabric in the Scriptures is to love one another. And so what we're doing, I've, I've commended to you, by the way, uh, Max Lucado's book, How Happiness Happens. It's, it's his study of several of the one another passages. He, he clusters them into categories. And he ends his book with love one another to sort of tie the whole thing together. We're, we're taking a little different approach. We're laying out the love one another passages before we move into to greet one another and serve one another be kind to one another, and all the different types of one another passages that occur in the New Testament. So Romans chapter 13 today, uh, verses 8 to 14. If you found that in your Bible, stand with me if you would. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen as we read God's Word together. Follow along as I read. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires." What if we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord teach us today to connect law and love. A lot of folks are confused on that. They're legalistic and they don't have love. They're loving and they've forgotten about God's law. This passage and many others like it call us to weave together and be sure not to separate what God has joined together. Law and and love, and then to recognize that we fulfill the law when we love according to God's standard, when we love one another. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week, I'm just going to remind you, I won't do this every week, but I'm going to remind you where we've been in this one anothering series. We started out with Jesus commands us to love one another, John 13, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. We said to you then that changes the dynamic. We're going to look at the passage from the Old Testament day that talks about well, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that is still true, but, the, but the, the standard, the lenses through which we see that is Jesus' commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That's what drives us now if we're followers of Jesus Christ. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you're still commanded by God to, to love your neighbor as you love yourself because God who made us knows that we have a sense of self-preservation about us. We care for ourselves. Hardly anybody just lets himself go completely. If that happens, it's because circumstances are pressed upon them. We are self-preservationists by and large. And so that's the standard. But Jesus raises the standard. We began with that. We looked secondly that the love of God is a motivation to love one another. God has loved us. How can we help but love others? We've talked about loving one another as friends of Jesus. If you've been saved by grace through faith, and I've been saved by grace through faith, we are friends together because we're friends of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We looked at it in two parts as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. That we can say this, saying faith, but saving faith, real saving faith, changing us from the inside out, provokes in us a love for one another. We looked at that in two installments. Then the most recently we looked at two installments on loving one another with family affection. If we're brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're friends one of another because we're friends of Jesus, then there has to be a family aspect to this. We don't see one another simply as, well, that person is a member of the same church I'm a member of. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my family. 
And I've told you before, and I hope you believe this, when we have those opportunities to, to, to get away, Karen and I do, whether we're away preaching somewhere or whether I'm away even with my, with my extended family, Karen's extended family, we enjoy being around them. But you know what? Without exception, every time I miss being with this family. This family. Because Jesus Christ's blood has washed you and saved you and is sanctifying you. I have more in common with you than I do with some people whose DNA I share. We're family. So we looked at that the last couple of Sundays. Today I want us to take a look at this idea that love fulfills the law. Uh, chapter 13, if you're familiar with Romans, is the is a, a first part of the passage. We didn't read verses 1 to 7, but it's a call to being a what we would call a, a, a true patriot. A, pr- a patriot whose patriotism is driven by his love and regard for God, recognizing God is the one who establishes governments. God raises up governments, put down, puts down governments. The second part of the passage, which takes up our theme today, is a call to that same principle, not only to be good citizens in our country, but to be good neighbors one to another. And in doing that, we fulfill the law. I would remind you, I went through a series on the Ten Commandments over a decade ago now, and we looked at each commandment, and I pointed out to you then that the first four commandments, no other gods before me, uh, no graven images, no taking my name in vain, honoring my day, the Lord's day, keeping it holy, setting it apart, like, like, not like the others. That the first four, or the first table of the law, was given to Moses on two tablets of stone. The first four, the first table of the law. Speaking of our responsibility, the relationship we must strive to have with God, that, that vertical relationship, if you please. We suggested to you that the last six, with number five being a bridge commandment, because it says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you, that it is a bridge commandment because you see it speaks of authority. And if we're going to have the relationship we have with God, we need to recognize God is our original parent. He's our creator. And so we're to honor Him. But it's also a bridge because it takes us into the second table of the law, which speaks of our relationships to one another. First four, relationship to God, that vertical. Last six, relationship to one another. And in that vertical and horizontal relationship dynamic, we have a cross formed. And so the second table teaches us that we're not to murder, number six. Not to commit adultery, number seven. And not to steal, number eight. Not to lie, number nine. Not to covet, number ten. I've suggested to you before that when you go through all ten and you understand that where we have a prohibition, you shall not, that there is also an admonition built into that. We shall do certain things. And I've showed to you that when you get to number ten, you shall not covet. It has to do with your neighbor, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's animals. But covetousness, Paul says in Colossians, covetousness is idolatry. So where does number 10 take us? Back to the first table. Our relationship to God. And so you see that comprehensive aspect. In fact, the Ten Commandments are recognized by those who understand a good, balanced approach to evangelical theology in the Bible. They're called the moral law, summarily comprehended. That means that all of the morality of the law, there's 630 commandments in the Bible, all the morality of the law can be summed up in one or more of these Ten Commandments. Any commandments you can show me from the Scripture, I can trace back to one or more of these ten. So the Ten Commandments are the moral law summarized, if you please. So we want to think about that today. And think about our duty, if verses 1 to 7 are our duty to as citizens to our country, and verses 8 to 14 are our duty to one another, to fellow citizens. What does it teach us to do? Well, it's interesting, in verses 8 to 10, we're told to to owe no one anything. In other words, if we have debt, our goal ought to be to get out of debt as quickly as we can, as feasible as it is. Particularly personal debt. Because here it says, owe no man, no one anything. That's the goal. 
Uh, we know from Scripture the borrower is a slave to the lender. And some know the, the freedom of getting out. I was talking with someone earlier this week, and they were telling me we've, we've, we've removed this debt and this debt and this debt, and you can, you can just hear it, the, the excitement. So the goal is no personal debt uh, as, as, as much as possible get out of debt. But there's a flip side to that. There is a debt that the Bible says we have incurred that we will never pay off this side of heaven. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. And it's in a present tense there. So the force is, except to continue loving each other. Which means, if you're in a in a family as husband and wife, father, mother, parent, children, sons, daughters, siblings, that you can never say before God, I've loved that person enough. Because the word comes back, no, you haven't. Keep on. You have a debt there. You pay it off when you die. Oh, no one, anything except to keep on loving each other. And then the reason is given here. For the one who is loving, that's present tense again, not the one who tried love, not the one who loved for a while and ran out of steam, the one who is loving another has fulfilled. This is fascinating movement of tenses here. Has fulfilled the law. Wait a minute. Pastor, you just, you just summarized for us the Ten Commandments. I want to show you something. Because he goes on and says, he, he cites, notice what he does, he cites here from the second table, which teaches us, if we understand how to uh, exegete Scripture, but this is what when he says has fulfilled the law, certainly the first four commandments are there, but, the, but it's the last six that he is thinking about for the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, that's number seven. You shall not murder, that's number six. You shall not steal, that's number eight. You shall not covet, that's number ten. Now he didn't cite number nine, but it doesn't mean it's okay to lie. He's, he's just citing the second table of the Ten Commandments. For these commandments which teach us about how we're to relate to one another, and then he says, and any other commandment that exhorts us to show kindness. For example, you shall not commit adultery. That's negatively stated. What you shall do is you shall respect the institution of marriage and protect the marriage bed with integrity. We shall do that. We're to be advocates of the biblical definition of marriage. I don't care where the culture goes on this. God says in His Word, one man, one woman, joined in a one flesh relationship in a covenant commitment for life. That's the standard. We defend the standard. We realize not everybody has has lived to the standard. Some have experienced divorce. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. We went through all of this and we studied through these commandments. But we hold up the standard. We're not going to back off from it. And I don't care how many candidates running for president tell us that if he or she is elected president, that the church is going to be made to submit to the cultural perversion of marriage, I will say to them, we will say to them, no, we will not. We have no king but Jesus. And He's told us what the standard is. So, there's that positive. Uh, you shall not murder. That's a negative. What the positive is though, we shall do all we can to protect our own lives, self-defense, and the lives of others. Protecting the innocent, those who cannot protect themselves. That's why we are so adamantly pro-life. We're so adamantly for the abolition, complete abolition of abortion. We shall do all we can do. Protect our own life and the life of others. You shall not steal. Negative. What we shall do is we shall respect the right 
to own and keep property. We shall respect one another's property. All right? You shall not covet. Covetousness, of course, is a discontentment with one's providences in life. A discontentment with what one has or doesn't have. A discontentment with what others have that we may not have. We're not going to covet. We're going to be content with God's providence in our lives. We're going to say, in all things, He is good. The little mantra you hear from people, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. That's how we see Him. We never feel shortchanged by God. That's the positive expression of that. And so, so you see that. And it says here that, that the second table of the law is summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. That comes out of Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus was asked by a lawyer who was trying to trick him up. And we've, we've talked about this before. He came to him, asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Because he knew if Jesus said three, that by choosing one, he had denigrated the other nine. He had, he had made them less important. Jesus knew what was up. Remember, if, if the Ten Commandments were written on two tables of stone by the finger of God, how has God ever had a finger? Only in the second person of the Trinity. Jesus Christ is the only time God has, has taken on a real incarnation. And any time we read of a theophany in the Old Testament, that is the appearance of God, God taking on a face, the fourth person in the fiery furnace, the one traveling with the angels to Sodom and Gomorrah, to, to see Abraham and then on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah. These theophanies, this is Jesus. This is the second person of the Trinity. The second person of the Trinity wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. Jesus has the right. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's table one. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. In other words, the second thing I'm going to point out, he's not saying these are secondary commandments. He's saying the second tablet is like the first. They're co-equal. You can't separate them. You can't say, well, I never murdered anybody. But if you're not remembering the Lord's day to keep it holy, you're breaking all of them. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He is summarized here. The first four, love God with all of our being. The second, love our neighbor. Well, what's the standard under the Old Covenant? That you love yourself. So what comes out of that? What we call the golden rule. As you would that men would do to you, you do even so to them. Treat other people like you want to be treated. That's the love your neighbor as you love yourself idea. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus says on these two tablets, the moral law summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments, hang all of the law and the prophets. That is summary speak for the Old Testament. Jesus says the Old Testament summed up in loving God with all your being, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. He says the, the law is fulfilled. Galatians 5.14, Paul picks up on this. It says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Not, not, there are several words here. One thought. One reality. One admonition. One command. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. How can he say that? He left out the first one. Because you see, you cannot love your neighbor as you ought to love your neighbor, if you do not love God, as you ought to love God. God is the only one. We talk about this. You cannot agape anybody, that unconditional love, until you've received the unconditional love of Jesus Christ shown to sinners 
by the Holy Spirit in the new birth. Galatians 6 2. We'll come back to, we'll see this one again in our study. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's he showing us there? Well, a couple of things I want you to see. That's love. All these one another's we're going to be looking at is fulfilling what we're called upon to do. And he says that you fulfill the law of Christ. I have some friends in ministry who want to play the law of God against the law of Christ, who suggest that because we have Christ has come, that the law of God has been put aside. Now, they don't really believe that. But they say that, it seems to me, to call us to a higher law. I want you to turn to something. I didn't put this in the slides. Turn to 1 John. We mentioned this when we were in 1 John recently. I want you to see this again. 1 John chapter 5. Getting in verse 1 of 1 John 5. Everyone who is believing, I'm going to give you the force of the verbs here. Everyone who is believing that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. In other words, current faith is evidence of past rebirth or born again. Has been born of God. And everyone who is loving the Father, there's your first table, is loving whoever has been born of Him. There's loving the brothers, doing good to all, especially to the household of faith. By this we know that we are loving the children of God when we are loving God and obeying His commandments. Wait a minute. God and His commandments. How can you play the law of Christ against the commandments of God when they come, the idea of them come from the pen of John in one of the last books written in the New Testament? My point is they are the same. When it talks about fulfilling the law of Christ, what is opened up to us is that loving God with all of your being, loving your neighbor as you love yourself, is taken to a standard. We can, we can see that uh, in an idea, but when Jesus Christ comes and lives on this earth, we see the law walking. We see the life of Jesus. We see what loving God looks like. We see what loving others looks like. And so that's why Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. He's not setting aside the Ten Commandments. He's saying, here, put my lenses on to understand them that you love one another as I have loved you. You not only have the precept in the Ten Commandments, you have now the example of Jesus Christ. Uh, one of my pastor friends said the Gospel can be summed up, that God the lawgiver gave Jesus Christ the law keeper to live, die, and rise again for lawbreakers. So you see law and love woven together. The moral law commands that we do our neighbor no harm, but good. No harm, but good. What's the best thing we can do for our neighbor? The very best thing. I would say it's a two-pronged idea. We can live a compelling gospel life before them, which you hope will provoke them to ask, tell me, tell me for the reason, for the hope that you have. Scripture says we're always to be ready to give that answer. We can live a compelling gospel life before them, but we can also speak to them about the truths of the gospel. God's claims on the lives of creatures made in His image, created in His image. Our text goes on to say, verse 11, you know the time. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep for Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. We're running out of time, folks. However much time each of us has left, I promise you this, we have one week less than we had last time we got together on the Lord's Day. None of us know when our time is up. God does. He's numbered our days. We're not going to live one day short, one day beyond the days that He's numbered. Consider the time. We've never really had time to to ponder, will I show love for that person? We're commanded to. We need to have a sense of urgency that increases upon us to love 
one another. And in loving one another, guess what John says in 1 John? That the commandments are not a burden for those who have been born again. You hear the unconverted world, you hear the religious world, when you talk to them about commandments, say, oh man, you mean I've got to... You mean... Don't be surprised by that. They're not being transformed from the inside out. A person who's been born again and taught biblically will delight to find out what God has commanded. Just as you would delight if you loved your spouse and you really wanted to just blow your spouse off their feet with a gift, and you knew that I knew what it was, and you came to me and I told you, you wouldn't go, oh man, I'm sorry I asked. No, not if you really love. You'd be grateful to know how to show love. Well, that's what the commandments are about. It's how to show love for God. How to love others in a way that honors and pleases God. That, that ought to be our agenda, should it not? Why would we be interested in, in making up what we think constitutes love for God? I've told you the story before when Karen was delivering uh, maybe joy. It was the joy of Joanna. Uh, I couldn't go in for Josh and Jason. The, the hospital had strange, archaic rules. The dads had to wait in the lobby and watch for a light to come on, whether it was pink or blue. Uh, but I was able to be there for Joy and Joanna and Jennifer. I forget whether it was Joy or Joanna, but I, I'd taken, we'd taken classes. I was ready for this. I was going to comfort her while she was in unspeakable pain. And I guess I got nervous. And I was tapping her on the shoulder, I, trying to comfort her, comfort her. She finally says, please stop tapping me on the shoulder. You're driving me crazy. Now, I could have said, wait a minute, this, I, I, this is, I infallibly know that this is what is good for you. If, it's not, if, if, if she doesn't think it's good for her, it doesn't matter what I think, does it? If God's told us how, how He expects us to love Him, it doesn't matter what we think about how we ought to love Him. We ought to know, want to know. And we love Him. We say we love Him. We sing how we love Him. We gather because we love Him. We pray. We read the Word. We worship. All these things because we love Him. It's out of out of the response of His love for us that we show Him our love. But He also has determined that the measure of our love for Him is found in how we love others. Love one another. That's how He can say that love in this way, agape loving one another, one anothering is, has fulfilled the law. Everything spelled out in word in the law is accomplished indeed when we intentionally, preemptively, proactively seek to love one another as followers of Christ and then love others outside, love the strangers. We talked about that last week. He says, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed closer. The end is closer. We have less time. We sing, we'll work till Jesus comes. We have less time to work till Jesus comes than we did yesterday, last week. Let's, let's think in those terms. We cannot afford to act like we're going to live forever and put everything off. The night is far gone, verse 12. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. That casting off, that's being transformed, Romans 12. In view of God's mercy, verse 1, I beseech you, I plead with you to stop being conformed to the image of... In other words, stop acting like the world. Stop wearing the world's agenda. Take it off. and be transformed. Keep on being transformed. The word there you know is metamorphosis from the inside out by the renewing of your mind 
that you may prove by the way you live that God's revealed will, which is summarized in the Ten Commandments, is good for you. It is perfect. It's, it's not lacking anything for you. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He has given us His Word. And in salvation, He has given us the Holy Spirit. We've been born again by the Spirit who now inhabits us so that we've been made partakers of the divine nature. His Word now is, is food. His Word now is honey. His Word now is milk. His Word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We hide it. We memorize it. We memorized Isaiah 53, 6 this morning. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We hide that in our heart. We're being transformed. Cast off the works of darkness. And put on the armor of light. The, you know the armor of the Lord in Ephesians 6. Uh, I think I've got that as a slide. Let's go to that, folks. Verse 11, Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You won't otherwise. You won't. You can go through life saying, oh, how I love Jesus because He first looked. But if you're not arming up you're not intentionally, daily equipping yourself with the armor of God. You will not stand against the schemes of the devil. You'll be taken captive by the devil to do his will. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And firm. And he describes the pieces having fastened on the belt of truth. God's Word is truth. Everything you hear in life, everything you read, needs to be filtered through the lenses of Scripture. If it does not comport with Scripture, it's not worth knowing, pondering, considering. The belt keeps it all together. You don't have God's truth. You don't read God's Word. You don't take it seriously. It's not a lamp unto your feet. It's not a light unto your path. It's not, not something you feed upon like milk and honey, hide in your heart. Then life will come apart for you. And you know people like this. They're not driven by truth, not led by truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, whereby God looks at us and does not regard our sin, does not count it against us. He accepts us as righteous because of who Jesus Christ is, what He has done for His people. And our receiving that by faith in Him, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the Gospel of peace. You see, when you come to Christ, you're given new shoes. You might say, those look like comfortable shoes. But you can go all day in shoes like that. And you can. You can. You stand fast in Gospel shoes. The Gospel of peace. Because we know that we have peace with God. Christ settled that. God's not at enmity with us anymore. We're not His enemies. He's not intent on destroying those who are disobedient to Him in us. Because we've trusted in Christ. And we have peace with God so we can stand whatever life comes. And peace like a river attends my way and sorrow like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, you've taught me to say it's well. It's well with my soul. Peace with God. Peace with one another. We're to be peacemakers because we stand firmly in the Gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith. Trusting the Lord. You trust the Lord in the providences when the devil throws his darts at you to discourage you. You're not utterly discouraged. Maybe taken aback, surprised, disappointed, dismayed, but not utterly discouraged. You stand with the shield of faith. But the moment you drop that shield, the moment you stop being driven by faith in Christ, trusting in God, in what you can see and what you can't see, the moment you drop, the fiery darts can sting you. 
Peter was walking in the shield of faith on the ocean, come on the sea, coming to Jesus. And as long as he looked at Jesus, believing Jesus could keep him up, he was walking. When he began to look at his circumstances around him, when he began to look at the waves lapping up over his feet onto his ankles, he took his eyes off Jesus. Faith was replaced with doubt. And he began to sink. And so will you and I if we drop the shield. And the helmet of salvation, that knowledge of who God is, what He's promised to do for His people. See, Christianity is not primarily an emotional thing. Christianity is a, is a, is a mind-changing thing. And when the mind is changed, the heart is gripped. And the heart and the mind together grab the chooser, the want to, and fix it so that it predominantly chooses to love God, love others, to follow Christ, deny ourselves. The helmet of salvation. So we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. We shall be saved from the very presence of sin. And the sword of the Spirit. Someone said the only offensive weapon in the panoply of armor. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Would you want to be on the board spinning around with a knife thrower who walks up to the knives and says, I've always wanted to do this. No. I want somebody. Look, I wouldn't want to be there in the first place. But I find, I find myself there. I want the guy holding the knives or the guy holding the knives. You know what they're doing. To have thrown these enough that they're not going to miss. That, or they're not going to hit, I guess. But they will miss me every time. The sword of the Spirit. What is it to you? Is a nice, shiny piece of armor, a memento, hangs over the fireplace. It's nice to look at, tell stories from. Or is it a weapon that you've learned to wield? One of the things they tell you about this whole concealed carry discussion going on right now, and open carry now, and constitutional carry now, is you need to have lessons. Get lessons. Don't think that just because you own a gun that you're qualified <laughs> To handle it. Now, I'm for constitutional carry. I, I believe the Second Amendment. We need to be trained. As a policeman told me one time, if you ever draw that weapon and are not sure you're going to use it or don't know how to use it, believe me, the person you draw it on will take it and will use it on you. Most likely. So this idea of being equipped in the full armor of God. Put off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Then the next thing he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. Well, what's he talking about? My wife hasn't done it recently, but she likes to rearrange furniture. And the den always gets the most intense attention. Therefore, you dare not walk into our den in pitch blackness at any given time. My shins will testify to that. You'll encounter furniture that wasn't there before. So I know that. And I know if I'm coming into our den, in fact, if you go to our house right now, you'll find 90% of the time a lamp by my chair that stays on 24-7. doesn't have to be on. But if I'm heading in that direction at night, I want some light. Okay. Live in the light. Walk properly as in the daytime. Not stumbling in the night. Not in orgies and he delineates. Not in orgies and drunkenness. In a, in a partying lifestyle. Well, that basically is the expression, well, don't I deserve to have some fun? Can I enjoy? Well, my question is, can you, can you not enjoy life within the bounds of God's descriptives? Why do you need to go outside of those? Why do you need to turn your back on those in order to have joy? 
Not in these ways. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Those pleasures, and they're real pleasures, and they're wonderfully experienced pleasures in the bonds of marriage. But they're pleasures for a season. They turn bitter when they're embraced illegitimately. Not in quarreling and jealousy. In other words, getting along. You have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If anybody ought to be a peacemaker, if anybody ought to know how to bring resolution, reconciliation, it's those of us who've been reconciled to God by the blood of Christ. Not that way, but, as we close this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember? Put off the works of darkness. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That breastplate of His righteousness. He perfectly kept the law. You and I did not. Have not. If we live this next week, there'll be occasions when we will not. But Jesus did. Completely. Satisfied. God's divine justice. In His active righteousness of perfectly keeping the law of God. His passive righteousness of submitting Himself to the painful, shameful death of the cross. Satisfying God's divine justice by the suffering and dying. Taking in His body our sin on the tree, even though He knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. The imputed righteousness of Christ. We're talking about this on Sunday nights, by the way, in this study on justification. The imputed righteousness of Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Find our desires in Christ. And in Christ, if you love God, and if we love Jesus as He has loved us, and love one another as He has loved us, it is amazing how full joy life is. And you know this. When you're thinking your clearest, you know that that while it is fun to receive and is a blessing to receive, it is more blessed to give. The greater blessing comes to the giver, the delight, because we're living like the original giver, the God who so loved sinners like you and me that He gave His only begotten Son. And Jesus comes and He gives Himself a ransom for many. And then the Father and the Son, when, when the Son ascends to heaven, the Father and the Son come together and they give the Holy Spirit to come and indwell all who are born again. The giver. The giver. Make no provision for the flesh. We don't, we don't need it. We don't need to satisfy those desires. Because if we are satisfied in God, it's amazing how He channels the desires. And we find our greatest satisfaction in loving one another. And in doing that, we know, we know that, the, that the, the new covenant is fulfilled. I will write my law on their heart. Not going to be a covenant like I made with their forefathers. Two tablets of stone by the time Moses got down off the mountain from Jesus having written the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. They had already abandoned Moses, figured he'd been killed by God, and they were making a molten image out of the gold that they had taken from Egypt. Not like the commandments I made with their forefathers, which they broke. God says, I'll give them a new spirit a new heart. They will delight to do my will. You see, that's what loving one another is. It's a delight. It's not done begrudgingly. It's a delight to do the will of God. It is obeying God as He prescribes for us to obey Him. And He says, and I close with this, Him who honors me, those who take seriously my word, my will, my way, him who honors me, I will honor. I will honor. And he who despises me, because that's God's opposite of honoring him. We'd like to think it's dishonor, and then we'd kind of let that be kind of nebulous as to what it is. No, God doesn't let it be nebulous. Him who honors me, I will honor. Him who despises me, 
I will esteem lightly. You know what esteem lightly looks like? Psalm 2. Let us break their bands asunder. We will not have this one over us. He who sits in the heavens esteems them lightly. He who sits in the heavens laughs. He mocks them. You see, when we make a mockery of God's Word, when we make a mockery of what it means to be followers of Christ, He mocks us. Love. Agape love. One anothering love fulfills the law. Just as He said we would. Jesus said in John's Gospel, if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. He who has My commandments and keeps them, He it is who loves Me. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before You now in Jesus' name. and Help us to understand how You have wed together law and love and how we don't have to, uh, to, 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 in our lives, make them all about legal duty. In fact, we don't have to make any of it about legal duty. We can, we can see what you prescribed in the law and delightfully, delightfully obey you. Loving you with all that we are. Loving one another as Christ has loved us. Oh, help us. Thank you for those who are committed to one another, committed to growing in that dimension as a disciple. Thank you for those who are, who are considering this, who are desiring this, who see the need and the value of it. And I pray for those who, who would dismiss it. I think it's a matter of indifference. Your word tells us far otherwise. To those who are not yet followers of Christ here, I pray that you will come. Save them by your grace for your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.